Friends, welcome to this daily devotion. I'm Mark, and I'm glad you've joined us. Just take a moment. Take a breath. Center yourself as we seek to grow in the love of God and neighbor. Friends, hear the invocation. Lord Jesus Christ, you demonstrated faithfulness in all of life, even to death on a cross. Grant unto your grace, unto me, your grace and strength to faithfully follow you all the days of my life. Amen. Friends, welcome to uh, this day of devotion. Our theme this week is faithfulness. What's it mean for God to be faithful? What's it mean for us to be faithful? Eventually, we'll talk about what faith is in itself. Our theme psalm is Psalm 89. Today, we'll pick up in verse 5. Heaven thanks you for your wondrous acts, Lord, for your faithfulness too. In the assembly of the holy ones, is there any in the sky who can compare to the Lord, who among the gods is equal to the Lord, God is respected in the council of the holy ones. God is awesome and revered more than all those around him. Who is like you, God of the heavenly forces? Mighty Lord, your faithfulness surrounds you. God bless the reading of the psalm. I wanted to end there because I think that's such a powerful, that's such a powerful phrase. Mighty Lord, your faithfulness surrounds you surrounds you. Again, we have this theme that God is faithful. When we're not faithful, God is faithful. When we're not true, God is true. When we're not good, God is good. God cannot be anything but faithful. And I wonder if we link of the image of living into the image of God in us, the the imago Dei, the, the divine in each of us, when we when we look to become more Christ-like, when we look to become more of our true selves, whatever kind of wording you want to use there, what would it be like to be surrounded with faithfulness? For you, that's what I'm talking about, not esoterically, but but for you and me, what, what's it mean to be surrounded by faithfulness? For people to look at you and say, wow, that person is faithful. Or 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 to have and, and not to boast of yourself, but to say, there's something about that person, and I think it's their faithfulness. Their faithfulness to their family, to their spouse, to their children, to their vocation, to their mission, to the mission, to their devotion, whatever it is, their faithfulness to God. Ultimately, I mean, for me, faithfulness to God impacts my faithfulness to everything else. How would that look if it surrounded you and impacted every moment of your day? You're coming and going, you're waking and sleeping, your eating habits, your time you spend, the talents you have and how you use them, your service, your witness, your giving, your generosity, your thankfulness. What would it look like to be surrounded by faithfulness? I don't necessarily have any answers to that. I just think it's a fascinating question to ruminate on. Our anthology reading comes from Letters from the Desert by Carlo Corretto. God gives us the boat and the oars, but then tells us it's up to you to row. Making positive acts of faith is like training this faculty. It is developed by training as the muscles are developed by gymnastics. Hmm, Interesting. I can see some, you know, I don't believe in a God who created everything and walked away. And so I could see the extreme take of what Carlo is saying is that. Um, I don't think that's really what Carlo, I've read enough of him. I don't think that's what he believes either. I think he believes God is active in our world. But this idea that God has given us everything we need to do good, to be faithful, uh, and, and, 
theologically, as, as a Christian, we would say, uh, the things that we could not do ourselves, God has empowered us to do because of the person of Jesus Christ, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Like, the things that we cannot do, God strengthens us and enables us to do. But when it comes to those big problems, and I know sometimes we just get overwhelmed by, you know, I mean, even Jesus says, the poor will be with you always. Uh, there's different ways to interpret that. But there, there are these big problems and, and big injustices and how what can we do? And if we really think about it, a lot of the solutions to problems in our world are available. Now, they're difficult because not everyone's very good. A lot of people participate in evil. A lot of people miss the mark. A lot of people really comes down, in my opinion, a lot of people worship themselves. Some more than others. I think we all worship ourselves a little bit, but some to an extent where nothing else matters. And if those people have power, if those people have a lot of resources, they can be involved in great, great evil, more so than probably you or me. Uh, the, the impact, the, the evil impact we have is somewhat limited, uh, depending on who you are and what your standing is. Uh, but we can participate in some pretty, pretty terrible things. I, I think for us, not to be overwhelmed with the big issues, which I believe are solvable. I think it all does start, and this is the understanding of the United Methodist Church, it all starts at the local level. It all starts at the ground level. And it starts with you and me. Am I using what I've been given to do the most good? Am I doing all the good I can in all the times I can, in all the places I can, to all the people I can? Am I intentional about doing no harm? Am I intentional about attending upon the ordinances of God? Those are the three rules of United Methodism. Do no harm, do good, attend upon the ordinances of God, or stay in love with God, Bishop Job uh, uh, paraphrases as. What does it look to be, look like to be faithful with what we've been given? Not always, like, if I had this, I could do this. God's given you what you have. Are you faithful with what you have? Our scripture reading today comes from Hebrews, I believe. Hebrews uh, chapter 11. If you have time today, uh, you could read the entirety of Hebrews chapter 11. It, it goes through kind of the stories of God's faith from generation to generation. All those Bible stories we read when we're in Sunday school, we read those because they teach these great kind of moral, ethical uh, realities. They teach about how God loves us. They, so, they're so good. That's why we teach them, because stories are easy to connect to. Uh, and so the author of Hebrews is sharing these stories, but he starts like this in Hebrews 11. 1. Faith is the reality of what we hope for. The proof of what we don't see. The elders in the past were approved because they showed faith. By faith, we understand that the universe has been created by a word from God so that the visible came into existence from the invisible. And then the author goes on to kind of give his argument from all these great kind of patriarchs and matriarchs of uh, the Hebrew scripture. God bless the reading of the epistle to the Hebrews today. But this is this is a, a phrase, a, a Bible passage, Hebrews 11, 1. We, we talk about a lot. We bring up a lot because it is really a definition. We don't get a ton of theological definitions in the Bible, but this is a pretty stark definition. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of of what we don't see. And I like that. I like that hope is in there because I think hope is something really important in our world. Now, we'll also read in scripture that faith is a gift. It's not something because sometimes we, and it even says in, in verse two, the, the elders of the past were approved because they showed faith. 
but I think they were also given faith. And so faith is the reality of what we hope for. What do you hope for? For me, my hope is in God. My hope is in God's kingdom. My hope is that God is good. My hope is that one day all people will know God's love fully. And so for me, the gift of faith then is seeing that play out in real time. God has given me faith to recognize thy kingdom come right here, right now. So I don't have to wait until I die or I don't have to wait until some nebulous end, but that I recognize that my hope for the completion of love of God and neighbor, the hope for the completion of Christ-likeness in all people, the hope for the restoration of all things is living out in real time. When we get together, when we share love, when we make impact in personal lives and in communities, and I see that, and it's out there if you pay attention. Mr. Rogers always said uh, that his mom taught him to always look for the helpers. When, when things get bad, when, when times get tough, when there's disasters, when there's war, look for the helpers. You may not see them on the news. They may not be the talking heads, stories of the week. They're always there. There's so much good in our world. We just don't pay attention to it. Friends, today I offer you an opportunity for confession. Confession is an act of letting go. It's an act of seeking forgiveness and receiving. Hopefully it moves us to making amends, to apologizing, and to moving forward. Let us now bring to God all those things we would confess. Friends, hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Let us move forward, growing in love, love of God and love of neighbor. Let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I leave you with these words from John Wesley. O Lord, may nothing dwell in my soul but your pure love alone, till my every thought, word, and act be love. Yes, Lord, may your love possess me whole. You're my joy, my treasure, my crown. Until next time, friends, God bless. Goodbye. Amen. <laughs>